Okay, so um, we originally planned this as a fireside chat, so there's really very little structure to it, and then we would like to have you know as much input as possible. Um, uh, we have been thinking about you know the role of open source and inclusion around uh, journalism and human rights uh, work, and we thought that you know having a freedom uh, of the press foundation, the committee for the protection of journalists, and uh, Benedict could be a good mix for us to better understand how to move uh, toward a, a world where you know, encryption is a, 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 it, it's a, it's a better use and at the service of a journalism and human rights defenders. So that's kind of a, where this panel is coming from. Um, I will tell you a little bit of why I'm here, perhaps. Sounds good? Yeah. Maybe it's a bit all the same. So uh, I am Enrique Pirases. I work, I lead the human rights program at Benetech. Benetech is a, uh, it's a non-profit technology company based in the Silicon Valley wherever that is from here, um, that has been providing a free and open source information a management and inclusion technology for the global human rights movement. Um, we are increasingly interested in uh, supporting uh, journalists, uh, mostly because they uh, overlap with human rights defenders. In, uh, uh, for example, you know, they are another civil society group that struggles for accountability, transparency, and justice. Um, it's also a, a group that is under tremendous pressures from uh, governments and organized crime. And probably most uh, importantly is that uh, they are, in the same way that human rights practitioners are, they are tasked with collecting and storing information of some of the people, uh, of some of the most vulnerable populations out there. So we think that uh, it is important for us to contribute to that uh, work. Just as a bit of background, uh, Benedict has been working around for like 20 years and it's mostly around uh, an open source and doing crypto tool. So our perspective of this is it's mostly about providing you know, strong crypto, you know, what Edward Snowden would call you know, properly implemented uh, strong crypto. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, strong crypto should be, as well as open source, should be considered as like, the baseline of human rights and journalistic work, mostly because of the reasons uh, that uh, people like Edward Snowden and, uh, and I have uh, uh, shared with us in the context of the most recent revelations of surveillance. So that's a little bit of why I'm here, and uh, it's definitely for me very exciting to be uh, next to both uh, Trevor and Job, uh, not only because of the organization that they work with, but because of the approach that they have been uh, 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 pursuing around some of these issues. So I'll pass it. Uh, so hi, my name is Trevor Tim. I'm uh, the director of Freedom Press Foundation. We're a relatively new organization, and our general goal is to support and defend journalism organizations that are dedicated to transparency and accountability. And uh, on our uh, board of directors are the NSA reporters, for example, Laura Poitras and Larry Greenwald, and actually we recently named Edward Snowden as well. And uh, you know, I think no story has better exemplified the fact that uh, digital security is not just a privacy issue anymore, it's, it's directly related to press freedom. It's actually one of the uh, most pressing press freedom battles that we're going to have over the next few decades. You know, um, we, we really started our organization to um, highlight the fact that the crackdown on sources and whistleblowers is actually a direct attack on journalism. And uh, you, know, you can see in the way that the Obama administration has approached prosecuting sources is that they um, really decided to actually go after the communications. So in the majority of the cases, you'll see that they subpoenaed email providers, third-party email providers, and third-party phone call providers, basically circumventing the way that they would have gone after sources for decades, which is to get journalists to testify uh, in court against them. Uh, you know, for, you know, since the 1970s, journalists have been that, uh, banding together and uh, you know uh, basically violating court orders and going to jail instead of giving up their sources. When the pros prosecut prosecutors figured out about six or eight years ago that uh, they didn't need to start calling reporters to testify anymore, they had easier ways to do it. So um, you know they figured out that they were going to move their investigations over to the initial conversations rather than after the fact in court. And so now I think journalists. Uh, are starting to realize that they have to respond by doing the same thing, and that requires them to um, protect their sources through encryption in a lot of cases, and using technology, not just the law. And so we have been crowdfunding for 
um, a variety of encryption tools, many of which you know are, are some of the most popular that many of you have heard of, like Tor, um, it, uh, tech, Red Foam and Tech Secure, uh, the Leap Encryption uh, Access Project, and the winner of the award last night, which I was really happy to see, uh, Tails, the um, operating system that runs off of the USB stick that uh, so many of the NSA reporters now rely on for their work. Uh, we also run the uh, Secure Drop open source whistleblower submission system. This was the, one of the last projects um, that Aaron Schwartz worked on before he tragically died last year. And uh, we have been busy in the last six months upgrading and uh, making it easier to use and helping journalists and organizations install it. And so we can talk about that a little later and why we think it's important, what problems it solves, what problems we still need to solve, and uh, how it go from there. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff King. I'm the Internet Advocacy Coordinator of the Committee to Protect Journalists, which has been around since 1981. Um, we are a, an organization dedicated to protecting journalists uh, worldwide, whether they are um, surveilled, censored, uh, harassed, um, kidnapped, murdered. We, uh, we advocate around these issues. Um, I also teach uh, the privacy of the digital, digital age and media and social change at UC Berkeley. And I, prior to coming to CPJ, was a constitutional litigator. Working primarily on First and Fourth Amendment issues, and what I'd like to talk about today is um, really the need for ubiquitous uh, adoption of encryption by journalists and by the public at large. Uh, I think that uh, Enrique and Trevor actually covered a lot of uh, ground that I would agree with. I would primarily add that. Journalists need to be using these tools, whether they are covering the state fair in Iowa for a small paper or the affairs of nation states. Uh, I recently wrote a piece about the National Security Agency and, uh, in particular, its um, storage capabilities that it's vastly expanding, um, which adds a sort of level of unpredictability to the future in terms of how data that's being generated now will be used, whether it will be data mined, um, uh, contents being stored, uh, and, and so forth. And so really there's a, a window of opportunity, I think, for the tech community developers to um, work with journalists and NGOs and academics and legal scholars um, and uh, user interface designers and marketing people to build these tools, build them better, make them easier to use, and make sure they get in the hands of everybody because you never know really when you can stumble across something that will become of interest to the NSA, the FBI, the mafia, uh, a, a corporation that you're covering. It's, it's, there are a variety of threat models out there and I, I just want to stress that um, anybody covering anything needs to be thinking about their sources. It's just too easy to um, to, to uncover sources via these um, needs of surveillance. So, so one thing about format, given that you know you are the, the bravest of all because you're here so early, uh, feel free to interrupt us, you know, bring anything that you want us to address. So let's not wait until the end. Um, yeah, there's a microphone right there. Yeah, there's one microphone right there. It's also, you can just shout. Um, um, but perhaps, so I have the sense that um, you know the need for encryption is relatively clear among this community, like among the people that is attending RightsCon, and I tend to think that is because you know the recent revelations of surveillance, uh, among other things, uh, have allowed us to understand that data can be collected not just today, it could be relevant over time, as you were just saying, and uh, and I would love to find some disagreement on that, but my sense is that we are all on the same. Like, we may differ in terms of like, if encryption should be something that should be used by everyone, should be used all the time. If encryption, for example, should be something that will uh, uh, be flying you uh, in a negative way. But uh, before we discuss that bit of analysis, this other bit that I don't think we have sufficiently discussed, and it somehow permeates this community and this idea of open technology. Um, and I'm not arguing necessarily in the context of free technology, I don't want to go to that you know, technopolitical debate. But my sense is that uh, 
some of the projects that are advocating for strong crypto are relying on open technology, like computer op, like Martus, Globalism, like a few others. And there's very little conversation about openness beyond encryption, which is, and again, another uh, debate that I find to be quite straightforward. You, know, you can trust open encryption because someone has to do it, right? But there's the, the, the biggest issue, the one that is not necessarily or exclusively about encryption, is uh, what, uh, uh, it's about the correlation between openness and uh, trustworthiness. You know, the, the, uh, journalists and human rights defenders are, uh, in a way, uh, are trusted with someone else's information after a very brief exchange. You know, someone will trust them either because of the role that they play in the society or the institution that is behind them. Uh, and, uh, and I found that, uh, maybe I have not heard, you know, a sufficiently strong argument or call for us to rely on open source technology uh, as a way to uh, increase, you know, the trust in some of these communities beyond encryption itself. And this is something that could permit, you know, like why you should use Thunderbird, you know, versus uh, I don't know what the other probably may be today. You know, how this one. Uh, so uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that bit, and I would really, really like to understand uh, what's your perspective on the openness bit of technology. Well, I think any uh, debate over um, you know, open source versus proprietary software was kind of settled by the NSA revelations, and, you know, especially in the, well, I, I mean, you know, I think you're talking about more broadly than just encryption tools, um, but I think the same principle generally, generally applies. I mean, uh, I, I th there has been a variety of reviews written about uh, various uh, mobile end-to-end -end encryption text apps in the last few months, and reviewers have just stopped even looking at proprietary tools because it's uh, it's so hard for people to trust them. I mean, the biggest story to come out of the NSA revelations was this, the story in the New York Times, the first one they did about uh, the NSA trying to break all types of encryption, and they have a variety of ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, they are uh, either bribing companies to um, hand over their keys, uh, they are, um, you know, leaning on them or threatening them with uh, legal orders. Uh, you know, we saw the Lobovitz situation where uh, the FBI actually uh, got a warrant for their SSL keys. Um, and they, the New York Times story even suggested that they were covertly placing agents inside uh, companies to, uh, to mess with their standards, uh, you know, without the company's knowledge. And so I think all of this lends to uh, the conclusion that uh, for something to be even remotely trusted, it has to be open source, and even then, uh, there's uh, you know still a lot of argument to be had. Uh, but uh, you know the the case for open source software in general, I don't think, has ever been stronger. So, first of all, was it a warrant, or was it a? I, I think it was a twenty seven hundred three D order. It? There was a variety of steps that okay. it ended in one. Okay. Okay. Um, I will. I will play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, you know, primarily on on. But I completely agree with you. Uh, but I think speaking from a practical standpoint, I would like to see uh, more people using encryption, even if it's commercial proprietary encryption. If it's somebody turning on File Vault. Um, rather than you know, downloading TrueCrypt and learning it, if the alternative is then not using encryption, um, with the caveat that, and, and Eva Galfrin and Jillian York at the DFF wrote a, a very good piece about this recently, it depends on your threat model, right? So if your threat model is the NSA, as Bruce Shire has said, um, you know, that's an uphill battle anyway. Now there are people, uh, including people at this conference, um, people who are, um, Board of, of Trevor's organization, who, for whom that is true. The NSA is their maybe primary threat model right now. Um, but there are plenty of examples of uh, other threats to journalists. And frankly, if they're sitting at a cafe and their laptop gets wiped right out from under their nose uh, while they're writing a sensitive story, I would still rather that be encrypted with commercial software than not encrypted at all. That's it. Obviously, um, I think that's a right. And, and trustworthiness factor is um, 
is a major, major consideration when it comes to choosing open source technologies. So, you know, I, I think you're bringing up a strong point. I think the uh, so no, no effort is futile in that sense. I mean, people need to do it as much as possible. So I think that you're right in terms of like putting proprietary software, you know, making a space for proprietary software as long as people are able to security. And perhaps one of the things that this is hinting at is, you know, the challenges of adopting open source. You know, why, why is some of these proprietary software so much better for those users than open source? And uh, I know that you're interested in talking about usability. I mean, we just went through, you know, the ethical implications of open source encryption a little bit. But there's this big challenge, you know, around usability. A large number of the open source applications out there that provide encryption are just very difficult to use. They add a lot of overhead for some of our users. Do you want to speak a little bit? Sure. I think I think that one of the most disruptive things that could happen uh, would be to increase the usability and ubiquitousness of these tools. I know there have been other discussions about this, but I come from a legal background. I know enough, um, but I don't take that deep dive into code like a lot of people who are at this conference. And so, for me, it's a very practical question of knowing my constituents and knowing the risks, getting people up to a basic level that's going to protect them, and probably protect them pretty well, uh, depending on who it is that's angry at them. And journalists make lots of people angry because they tell the truth, and they tell the truth to power, that's their job. And um, through no fault of their own, find themselves very much at risk from a variety of sources. I just want to stress that. Um, but I think that one of the most interesting and sort of, uh, again, disruptive or radical things that has happened in the encryption world or in the communications world is uh, you know, Tor is now a browser bundle. You download it like Chrome and Firefox. And that's huge. That's huge. It means people can actually just download it and use it instead of having to configure, um, uh, configure software, configure the Firefox uh, browser itself. And I think that uh, with regard to other technologies, um, that would be a very good next step, is to start making things easier to use. Um, I didn't bring up UI designers by accident. I didn't bring up marketers by accident. I mean, we should make these things easy. We should make them cool um, and get people using them as broadly as possible. Um, partly because it creates network externality. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, real quick say, you're going to get, if you're going to get flagged because you use, um, you use so Tor, for example, or using other forms of encryption, and you know, we know that the NSA keeps that information indefinitely, but the more people start using these tools, the, um, I suppose, uh, less interesting it becomes that people are using them. Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, we're not gonna find any disagreements within this audience about that these tools need to be, be more usable and more ubiquitous, but I'm, I think I'm more interested in why they're not more usable and more ubiquitous. Uh, and I, you know, I welcome any comments from the audience about this. You know, I think we can look uh, at a great example, uh, a recent example that's been in the news is uh, WhatsApp, which was just purchased by Facebook for $19 billion or whatever. Uh, you know, they have 50 employees at WhatsApp. Um, 40 of them are engineers, and you know their uh, application has one purpose, to provide an easy way for people to text message back and forth around the world. And uh, when you look at the, uh, the people that they are hiring, they are professional developers, they're paying them um, probably uh, anywhere from $100,000 to $250,000. Uh, they are uh, trained in creating uh, applications that are easy for six-year-olds to use. And uh, when you look at uh, encryption apps, um, it's an entirely different culture, uh, an entirely different skill set that people use when uh, people that are interested in creating them to begin with. You know, number one, we have uh, a business problem where there isn't uh, as big of a market for something like this. Uh, there aren't, uh, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted app apps being sold to Facebook for billions of dollars because uh, part of uh, these large corporations' business model includes being able to, um, you know, sell advertising, personalized advertising, and uh, that just doesn't mesh with end-to-end -end encrypted technology because they will never be able to read the messages. 
Uh, you know, so WhatsApp has 40 engineers working for them. Tech Secure, which is obviously widely considered to be the best end-to-end um, uh, -end encrypted application that's um, you know, headed by Moxie Marlinspike, have, they have two people working on their Android app. They, uh, they're trying to create an iOS app right now. They have another two people working on that, only part-time. Um, and you know, there probably is a um, you know, very slim chance that they're gonna sell their company to Facebook for $20 billion. They can't pay their engineers uh, hardly half of what these uh, you know, companies that are being invested um, in by you know, Silicon Valley venture capitalists. So they're at a huge disadvantage to getting the type of talent they need. And not only that, but the, the, the type of, of people who are interested in building these apps are usually cryptographers or um, you know, hackers, um, people who have sysadmin backgrounds who are really interested in security uh, but don't necessarily think about usability because they've been steeped in uh, you know, this type of technology forever and uh, they take it as a second nature to them but don't understand that uh, regular people, non-technical people can't understand it. Um, so there it, it is, are, are various barriers that I think um, you know, these types of tools need to get over to um, really reach the masses in a way that could uh, make a huge difference. I mean, you know, in, in some countries, if you're using Tor, um, you, you know, you, your IP address can be flagged. You know, they can't see what you're doing over Tor, but if they have uh, access to the entire network, they can see the IP addresses that actually connect to it. Um, and uh, this is a huge problem when not a lot of people are connecting the tour so they can take everybody out. But if there are millions of people using it, for example, then that problem slowly disappears. But again, it's, uh, you, you'll see this problem over and over again with, with any encrypted tool, encryption tool, and um, there just aren't easy solutions uh, unless we can get uh, a lot more money, a lot more talent, and a lot more uh, development skills going to usability um, and, and you know, I think this problem has become more prevalent in the last year or so, and it's really become clear that, that usability is actually a security issue. And if things aren't usable, then uh, they're easy to break, they're hard to use, and people um, will eventually fail. And so the quicker everyone realizes that, I think, the better. So, yeah, I mean, again, how does this happen? I think it's a very strong point. You know, usability should be understood as a security feature. It should be safe in the numbers. And one click is one click too many. I'm phrasing what, what we're trying to say. And uh, I think it's interesting that in this venue we talk a little bit about you know, funding business models and the challenges you know, uh, for this, not just the creation, but also the adoption. Uh, and if you guys could talk a little bit about that, I am also particularly interested in hearing more about you know, the approach that you're following for the, uh, in, uh, the adoption of security drop among you know, institutionalized media, given not just the role that they play in, in the field from an ethical perspective or a practical perspective, but also given that their nature is different. They are in a position to potentially inject resources you know, to some of the field. They're in a different position than freelancers, and they may be, uh, there may be something that the rest of us can learn from their business model than something that security drop will fall over the next year. Sure, so I, I mean, I guess I can give a little background on SecureDrop first. Um, so uh, we, uh, SecureDrop was originally created by uh, Aaron Schwartz uh, in, and uh, in about a year before he died with uh, Kevin Paulson, who's actually uh, here in the audience today, uh, the Wired Investigation Center. And um, it, its basic premise is uh, to combine a bunch of tools that we know work into a much more usable format. So right now what it looks like is um, we are combining the use of Tor, uh, the use of GPG encryption, and uh, the use of Tails, the operating system uh, that won the award last night. And uh, essentially our goal is to lower the barrier for sources who want to submit documents to journalists but don't have a way of doing it, you know, email, uh, even if you're using encryption the metadata could lead back to your email address. If you ever try to get a truly anonymous email address in the past couple of years, you know it's close to impossible. But, you know, if you want a, a, a Gmail address, you need to you need to either have another phone number or another email address. So if you want another phone number, you have to go to the store, pay cash, 
with, uh, to get a burner phone. To activate that burner phone, you need another phone number. So where are you going to get that phone number? Are you going to go to a pay phone? Um, or are you going to use one of your friend's phones? And then when you finally get that, you have to go to a coffee shop that uh, you're not familiar with, uh, sign up for that email address, and then make sure that you never, ever sign up to that email address again from any other internet connection uh, that could be associated with you. So it's really, really hard. Um, and uh, mistakes can be made. And so Secure Doc really tries to lower um, these uh, problems. Uh, another huge problem Secure Doc goes after is the, this third party problem that I mentioned before. You know, um, the, the prosecutors figured out that they can subpoena third party email providers uh, for journalists or sources, emails, and the journalists won't find out until after. So Secure Drop takes away the third party completely. Uh, the Secure Drop servers sit in the uh, journalists, we actually recommend their, their general counsel's office at this point, uh, and um, the, the source is logging in through a web application, so uh, there is no third party to be subpoenaed. They can only go to the journalism organization if they want any type of data. Uh, and Prosecutors are loath to do this. They will avoid this at all costs. And even the very, very rare times they do, they're faced with a two, three year long legal battle. And then, so the final problem we try to solve is the metadata problem, which is, you know, there are, in all of these cases, you will see that, that uh, they will try to um, figure out who these sources are talking to through that metadata in their emails. And so we try to log as little metadata as possible. And uh, the metadata that we do log is deleted regularly. So even at the end of this giant legal battle, uh, hopefully there will be nothing for uh, prosecutors to get. And so that's basically the, 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 the idea behind <coughs> this stuff is that we're trying to solve the problems that have cropped up in the past decade because of all of this digital surveillance. Um, and, uh, but the, 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 the problem that we're always facing is that, as we've been talking about, security is hard. Um, you know, we can make it easier for the source, but then we also have to train the journalists on how to use tails, how to use GPG. Um, uh, and so, you know, we've taken the approaches that we want to take all of the pain out of this for media organizations as possible. So we will actually uh, go there physically on site to help them install Secure Drop. Uh, after we install it, we will sit there and train their journalists uh, and how to use it, and then come back regularly to make sure that they're doing everything proper. Um, you know, we kind of look at Secure Drop as um, a gateway drug to digital security because it uses all of these tools that uh, you can use more broadly, and it forces journalists um, to learn how to use them, and then hopefully they can spread this knowledge uh, more organization wide. Um, and so, right now, we have. I think five or six uh, active deployments, including The New Yorker, Forbes, uh, The Intercept, Glenn Greenwald's new publication, ProPublica, uh, and uh, Kevin Paulson has his own personal uh, secure drop. Uh, we just went to three major media organizations in the last three weeks. Uh, they haven't announced theirs yet. Uh, and so I'm afraid I can't say their names, but they are some of the biggest papers in the country. And so we hope that uh, by taking the pain out of this process, we can, um, we can help them fight back at least a little bit, uh, in a little way, uh, given that uh, you know, they're facing unbelievable investigations on the source side. I mean, there are two New York Times reporters who uh, every single person they've emailed uh, in the White House is under investigation, that is under leak investigation. And so obviously, you know, 90% of these people probably have never uh, given any sensitive information to a reporter, but that means that they have to spend thousands of dollars on a lawyer, their job is in jeopardy, if they say something wrong, uh, they slip up, uh, they can be charged with lying to investigators. So it just creates this giant chill in the air uh, for journalists uh, just, who are just trying to do their job. Even though it's not a crime to talk to reporters, it's kind of turned into one. And so we hope Secure Drop uh, can at least uh, help sources start to contact journalists in different ways uh, and think about uh, security uh, in a way that is, is as safe and secure as we can make it. So I would want to add just a couple points. Um, 
about why technologies such as Secure Drop and, and similar technologies are so important. Um, the first would be that it's not just uh, the current environment that we're talking about, um, and it's not just uh, email metadata and, and many of the other traditional ways in which uh, journalists and sources communicate digitally, but there are also issues of location tracking, facial recognition technology, um, there are a myriad of ways of tracking people through space and through virtual space that will just become more and more prevalent. Of course, in the US, the courts are struggling with these issues. We're also not just talking about the US. Um, these technologies, surveillance technologies, will become cheaper, they'll become uh, uh, more widespread, and uh, they will be in the hands of many, many other actors other than just the US government. So uh, at this point, um, that's already happening. Uh, but we have to think about sort of the overall uh, environment, um, the, particularly in terms of other forms of surveillance. So you can't just go meet with your source. I, I call the conversation a computer crime class I had uh, with Jennifer Granick and Richard Salgado in law school. Um, and you know, there was a uh, the point was made that at the time of the founding of this country, in some ways you had more, more privacy because you could go have a quiet walk in a field somewhere, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a friend who created a cipher that I think 2009, I think it was broken, um, using uh, uh, supercomputers. I mean, it was um, more opportunities through uh, just the lack of these technological tools to have private conversations in some respects. Um, and now, you could be trapped into that field. There could be a tiny recording device, somebody could have one of those spy movie parabolic microphones, which is not um, And the other point I want to make is that as much as I talk about usability being important, journalists really do have a duty to learn these things. It is part of the job now. If you want to protect your sources, you have to put in the effort. And so, um, I'm very grateful for the efforts of, of Trevor and, uh, and many other developers who work on these things and who are proselytizing them. But I also say that there is an onus on journalists to uh, engage with these technologies. And just to uh, go off the point that you just mentioned about, uh, you know, there were, journalists may have felt that they could have had more privacy in the past where they could meet somebody in a field or a parking garage or that sources felt that they could mail documents. Another example of of how surveillance has really exploded. Probably the most uh, underrated story that came out of the Stone revelations, actually it wasn't even a Stone revelation at all, it's something the New York Times picked up on, which is the US Postal Service is taking a photo of every single package that goes through their system, uh, and outside of uh, the package, so they can see um, the person's handwriting, uh, they can see where it's going, and if they put a return address. Uh, they can see where it is. So if you want to mail a package to a reporter, uh, it is much harder uh, to avoid surveillance than you may think. So uh, you have to be worried now about the handwriting on the package, whether you're putting a return address. Uh, you have to, if you go to the post office, they take a picture of every single person that walks into the post office to mail something. So you can't go into the post office. Uh, you have to make sure your fingerprints aren't on the package. So that one of the first leak convictions, a guy named Samuel Morrison in the 1980s, uh, because part of the reason he was convicted was because the journalism organization um, uh, handed over photographs that he had, uh, allegedly gave them with his fingerprints on them. Um, so you have to be worried about that. Uh, you can't obviously mail it from your home uh, mailbox because they can trace it back to you. So you have to go to a public location hopefully not anywhere near where you regularly visit, uh, avoid surveillance cameras on the way, and uh, once you do all this, put it in the mail, um, and you'll have no way of then communicating with the reporter whether they ever received it, uh, whether they have questions, uh, and if they can do anything about it. So um, it's very hard, no matter what um, medium you're using, uh, to communicate to completely avoid uh, surveillance or uh, potentially the IRA investigators after the fact. And uh, so I think, you know, a lot of people come to us and say, well, you know, mailing may be 
um, safer than a secure drop off. Um, you know, it depends, and in many cases it may not be. Um, so this is all all things that, that sources and journals have to be aware of now that they may not have had to before. We have a couple issues first, actually. I know you mentioned thinking of secure drop as sort of a gateway drug towards being secure online, and I also know earlier in the talk you were speaking about how you want everybody, marketing, usability, etc. How would you say the best way is for young people, I'm talking like junior high and high schoolers, doing their first ever campus paper, whatever it is, to start to think about these issues because those habits that they found when they're not a <coughs> profession are gonna be their sort of default habits. What would be your best use case scenario for somebody in their teenage years to become a secure digital citizen who might ever be a citizen journalist? So I would say that it, it would be important, especially for you know for younger than us, you know, not to think of the tools themselves, but to think of the problem and to think of the ethical things that lie behind the management of sources or the information of older populations. So technology evolves rapidly, you know, both the threat and open source, you know, internet software, if you want to call it like that, will go advanced. So the, what we do would be seeing over time would be very different from what we see today. I would say that if you are working on a newspaper, as I did when I was a kid, I think that probably the most important thing would be to play the exercise of you know managing the information about your sources with you know, extreme caution and not about you know using a specific tool. I think it's more of an ethical exercise than a technical one in the, at the moment of formation. Um, you know, I think the first thing that anybody needs to do is be aware of what's happening. I mean, it, there has been we've seen a sea change in the way. Uh, people view privacy ever since the Edward Stone revelations, partially because they just didn't know what was going on. I mean, I think a lot of people have said that uh, people didn't even care, didn't care in the past, but I think it just wasn't in their purview, and so they had an easy way uh, to ignore it, and now they don't. Uh, you know, people say that also, people say that younger people don't care about their privacy as much, but there's been two recent studies that showed actually, when you look at, they're much more conscious of the privacy settings on social media, uh, than older adults are, and actually restrict information more. And we've, seen, we've seen this the way that they have been moving to uh, applications like Snapchat that will uh, delete their messages as soon as they send them. And so um, I, I think young people are actually aware of this issue, um, at least in the general sense, because they, their natural instinct is, is to want privacy, despite the fact that they're always online, always posting things publicly, and so uh, it's just, the, the, the way to get young people involved is to uh, make these products more accessible to people who uh, haven't necessarily thought about the need for end-to-end -end encryption or even know what it potentially is. Uh, and that goes back to the problems we were discussing before, I think. So just, I just realized that our panel should end like eight minutes or so, so maybe we should just think that's what the program says, right? Unless I have a different program. Yeah. Um, you were about to ask something. Maybe. Yeah, I, I hate it when people say they have quick questions, but I have two quick questions and a long one. And you said this is a fireside chat, so I want to try to get the fire going. Okay. Thank you. So the first is, for your three organizations, what percentage of your users are using encrypted email now? Well, Martius does on the crypto, so anything that happens on Martius is crypto. Yeah, everything. but I mean, if, if I look up your PGP key while I find it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, one of the things that we have moved, I mean, you need to, the American expression is something like walk the talk. Yeah. I think it's very important that we do that. Great. So one of the things that we have been doing over the last month is try to go to the painful program and move to Argency, which makes our phone calls instead of 30 minutes being an hour and 15. <laughs> but it's, it's something that we have to do. Then. And same for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we have all of our, uh, all of our board members and staff members have their uh, PGP keys posted online, you know, our, our websites, HTTPS by default. We try to lead by example as well because we're, you know, the ones out there preaching about all this stuff. You know, I, for the best media organization, I think uh, if you look to the Intercept, uh, our former CTO is um, central to their security now, uh, and he has listed all their PGP keys. They have their secure drop on their contact page. 
Uh, they are HTTPS by default. They run their own Jabber server. They run their own email server instead of farming it out to Gmail again, third party providers. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, it, it's our goal to actually move these media companies into uh, doing this stuff more. You know, it's not just about secure drop, but it's about, you know, protecting the privacy of your readers. Um, it, it's about uh, making sure that your reporters have a, a uniform way of communicating. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen any other media organizations really adopt these things wholesale, but uh, I'm hopeful. Yeah, same for CPJ. Yeah, I would say that uh, I'm happy to report that we're actively in the process of doing a sort of comprehensive review of our security practices. And, and so so the second part of the quick question was, how many of you people here have security now? Well, you know you have security. Secure. Encrypted. <laughs> Secure. <laughs> Encrypted. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the problem I've encountered with organizations, and you guys are all encountering it, is it's really hard to get them to do this. So I work with organizations that have both reporters and are protecting reporters. They don't have secure encrypted email. How do you do it? How do you get over that barrier? So I, I'm kind of like a model planning dude. So uh, I, I would say that if you're working on human rights work on I mean, journalism, you have the responsibility to protect, you have the responsibility to do no harm. And today we know that one of the things that you can do is rely on open source strong crypto. So if you're not using it, you're not living up to the standard that you're supposed to be. That would be kind of like my very dogmatic point of view. Uh, when you're talking about media organizations, the uh, the skill level and the awareness level varies widely. Uh, I mean, there are, I heard the other day that there was a major news organization that uh, outright refused to install PGP for their reporters. One reporter actually left this organization partly for this reason, uh, because he had a bunch of national security sources that he, he couldn't talk to and he couldn't get the technical help he needed to talk to them. Um, but I think the good news is that in the past six months, they've actually realized that this is a problem. It's not that uh, most of them aren't actively ignoring it anymore. They just don't know what they have to do. And it's also a, a larger problem for them. It's not a one size fits all uh, solution. You know, they have a variety of different threats. You know, their national security reporters face threats from the US government subpoenaing them, but their foreign reporters face, uh, you know, foreign governments hacking them. Uh, trying to get in, or you know, Chinese hackers trying to get into their corporate network, and so they have all sorts of uh, things to take into account when they decide whether to uh, implement something uh, organization wide. That's why I actually have sympathy for them when uh, some of them switch over to Gmail because it's a small sliver of their sources that are losing their rights um, when it comes to U.S. subpoenas, uh, but it's also protecting them organization wide in a better way than they could possibly do uh, against Chinese hackers. So, uh, you know, it's security's hard. I would just add, I, we were sort of musing earlier uh, before the panel about um, whether it's freelancers or major institutional uh, media organizations that are uh, more actively engaged in these things. I, and I often wonder whether it's uh, veteran reporters. I've talked to some of them who said, well, this is not that different from when I was reporting Abroad in Ash, so I just think about the. I'm used to thinking about these things. Or if it's the 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 club reporters who are um, more familiar with technology, I would say that um, to the extent that there is a feeling of privilege or remove, um, you know, I think a large organization might feel that. We lawyers by training sometimes feel that like we're you know not going to be targeted. Uh, that should just be thrown out the window. We've seen uh, incredible aggression toward the press um, from this administration, and I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. We have time for one last question. And, but before we tackle that, just I would like us to think. I mean, if, even if we don't have time to think of, you know, what are the bits of technology that are missing? What are the problems that are unsolved? The needs that are unmet? And if you can think of them, and we have a few seconds after the next question, from them over here or just engage with the guys after the panel. Yeah, it's a great question. I would love to scale it as much as possible. I mean, the, the problem we have right now is, is 
purely we just don't have enough manpower. We have, uh, you know, uh, one person, James Dolan, who was one of the original uh, developers on this project, um, who's working on it full time, who's going to the journalism organizations to help them install it. He's troubleshooting with people if we can't actually physically go there. Uh, you can email us and we'll try to answer questions. Um, we're also trying to make the installation process much easier. It's already gone a long way from where it was uh, eight or ten months ago, where it was there was a security audit done of it by Bruce Schneier and um, some University of Washington researchers, which basically said that they couldn't install it. Um, and, and so we have really tried to make the documentation online a lot better. Uh, it's still a complicated process right now, but it's, it's doable if you have technical skill. The installation process is definitely the, the hardest part of it all. Um, we are currently also looking for funding so we can hire two or three more people to work on this project full time so we can actually go um, internationally and help uh, organizations in different countries uh, install secure drop. Basically the only reason that we focus on the U.S. is because um, it, it's, you know, this is where we're based and it, it's, uh, you know, easier for us to reach. And so uh, if the, the quicker we can expand the better, and that's what we hope to do over the next year. If I could make one very brief point, um, as with Secure Drop, really the installation or, or the, the opportunity cost, getting people over that hump to actually get them to use these tools is often the issue. People can use these tools, it's a matter of uh, getting people to install them, getting them to start using them, and as you said, it's a, you know, there are many gateways to uh, digital security. So I think that we should end this because we're past time. I want to, of course, thank you and thank you both. I mean, if you guys are thinking of doing anything related to journalism or if you have any questions, you should approach them during this day. And if you have any other questions that may be relevant for the rest of the techno activist community, or in particular ideas about you know what needs to be solved, what needs to be fixed, there's a bunch of us around that would be you know very happy to hear what you have to say. So thank you everyone for waking up so early.